Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed. Hi, welcome to Writers in Focus. I'm your host, James Taylor, and today I'm delighted to have as my guest Dr. Lawrence P. Jackson. May I call you Lawrence? Please do. Not Please Dr. Do. Jackson, Lawrence, no, really? Lawrence is great. Lawrence. Everybody knows me as Larry, so Lawrence is great. Lawrence, uh, by way of introduction, we are at the Fulton County Government Center in the Atlanta Fulton Public Library. Uh, I'd like to introduce you as a as a I'm still impressed by that. You're a full professor of English and African American Studies at Emory University. You are the author of such award-winning books as The Indignant Generation, A Narrative History of African American Writers and Critics, 1934 to 1960, that period between Harlem Renaissance and Civil Rights. And you wrote this superb biography of Ralph Ellison, Emergence of Genius, which to me was, oddly enough, the the first full-length biography of the Ralph Ellison? Biography of that, Ralph that, that's Ellison. incredible. You've written many scholarly articles. J ladies and gentlemen, go to JSTOR, go to the internet, just Google Dr. Lawrence P. Jackson, you'll see uh, his, his accomplishments in the world of academia. But we're here to discuss this most amazing book, your latest book, it's called My Father's Name, A Black Virginia Family After the Civil War, uh, published by the University of Chicago Press. and. I'm kind of in awe of this book, Lawrence. I have, I've never read a book quite like it. It's academically credentialed. It's footnoted. There's a bibliography. However, you talk about the most intimate things of your life. Uh, you talk about race relations. You talk about tobacco cultivation. You talk about what it was like to be human chattel in the 19th century in America. I'll let you, I'll let you get started, but by way of introduction, one more thing. See if I have this right. Uh, you have several beautiful children. You have a beautiful wife. You're looking at your kids and you say, you know, they should know where I come from. You wrote that book for what, wrote this book for that reason. And what I see is another reason. In the, in the introduction to the book, and maybe page 12 or 15, you're with two distinguished white scholars of the African American experience. Right. And I don't want to put thoughts in your mind, but the way I saw you saying, wait a second, these guys are studying my life. Sure. Okay. Sure. How did, you know, this was the, did the, I get that right? The genesis of the project. Um, you know, the book is called My Father's Name because uh, when my son was born, <clears throat> my wife, my, my former wife, and I, we decided we'd name him after my dad, who passed away when I was in college. And just the, the, the responsibility, the joy, uh, the burden, the obligation, the duty um, toward that name, it just caused uh, really something to open up within me and a kind of a yearning, um, maybe even some nostalgia, uh, certainly love for my own father. And I wanted to know more about what his experience was like. And then, of course, it led, since my, my dad was junior, it led very quickly to my grandfather, who I knew, you know, fleetingly. Um, you know, I was with you, my you, grandfather. Your father would take the aging we, Volkswagen at 55 we, miles an hour down the highway. We'd take a couple of trips down, uh, yeah, down, down Interstate 85, like I to guess, see the trees. over the 58. <laughs> and we had these cars, you know, in the 1970s, yeah. we had a fastback Volkswagen, yeah. and my dad would drive at, you know, 55. And, even my grandfather, you know, the joke between the two of them was always, you know, Junior, why don't you go and get a Cadillac? Let everybody know that you've got education. You know, don't, don't come down here in the country and look like you're living small, you know. I mean, show everybody how well you're doing in the city. And um, my, my dad was his own man, and, uh, you know, he liked, uh, he liked modest living, um, it, at least to a certain extent or with certain things. But um, I wanted to be able to give a portion of that experience to my own children. And then, of course, they're growing up in Atlanta, Georgia, in the Deep South, I mean, in a, in a place and in a way that I might not have been able to, to imagine. So it, it really it was uh, my son's birth and the conjunction of events that you've already mentioned. Um, I was having um, a, a number of really fulfilling and important conversations with a guy named Jeff Carici and another guy named Timothy Tyson. And uh, they had just had such, you know, such remarkable knowledge 
about this period. I mean, in fact, they were actually setting the terms for the way that uh, people would understand the 19th century South, the 20th century South, and race relations. And they were actually describing what my own family had experienced. And here again, but I had, you know, just sort of very slight information about it. When I went to college in 1986, um, it seemed to me when I took the course on uh, the history of black folks and race relations as, um, you know, sort of um, not introduction to African American studies, but I guess as the, uh, the history of African Americans was, was then called, I mean, race relations, the sociological term was the paramount term, right, yeah. at this period. And I, I think that my understanding at the end of the semester was that it was absolutely impossible to ever know any of my ancestors who'd been enslaved, to ever have any sure. sense of what their experience had been like. Um, certainly, I've, my, I've read the same books. Okay, okay. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, cer yeah, yeah, certainly. My yeah, gosh, yeah. I mean, you know, it's as if the idea that there might have been some element of uh, Africa in the people in the 18th century and the 19th century. I mean, that, but this was absolutely supposed to have been. They came over away. as blank slates. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so over time, you find out, hey, there's a debate that's going on here, and you've got, you know, a, either a minority report or you have some other evidence that. Uh, they are brilliant, I mean, absolutely fantastic books that are published that are doing things with scholarship that I would, you know, I could uh, dream of doing. And yet they tend to go in a direction, um, you know, saying that basically uh, the black experience is just like the white experience. And I, I, didn't, I didn't feel like that was true. And as I went on this journey, uh, you know, again, beginning about 2004 and concluding around 2010, um, I, I had the... The, the opportunity, I mean, it was almost a spiritual journey, as you can imagine. But let's, let's I, 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 love in, I love interrupting the professor. That's the all right. That's no, all right. I'm your student. I'm your student That's professor. Right. But let's, let's, I want the audience to be clear on this. Uh, you, you grew up in Baltimore. Your parents used to take you to visit your grandparents. In Danville, they, Virginia. In Danville, Virginia, which is in... Pennsylvania County. County, which is in the, where the lower end of the southern South end of Virginia, Virginia meets Virginia, North, North Carolina. Carolina. Right on the border. Chatham is the uh, county, county seat. seat. And uh, you had some recollections of this, you, a few memories. Yeah. And so the book basically begins by you saying, you know, I think I'm going to go yeah, back and, taking pu the journey and putter back. around. And, and I, want, I want the audience to get a sense of what this book is like. I want the audience to go out and buy this book and read it. You stop on these old roads that seem vaguely similar, familiar to you from your youth. And will you talk about like walking around and you see a house and you're looking for the house that your grandfather lived in and you see this guy that looks like um, an extra a redneck drinking and beer in the morning. Sure. You know, well, they were drinking beer. Yeah. <laughs> there was no shortage of drinking yeah, yeah, in, yeah, uh, yeah. in Pennsylvania on Sunday. But dry, I just I want the audience town. to get a sense of what this book is, how, what, what you write about. Yeah. So texture and detail yeah, are yeah. just absolutely important to me. I mean, they're important to my own work. But I, I, I wandered um, Blair's, Virginia, for an afternoon, about five hours, I guess. And I stopped, you know, more than a dozen people. And sometimes at a gas station, sometimes at a little country store, sometimes at something that was more like a juke joint, uh, sometimes in the, uh, the, the, uh, 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 the yard of a church. Uh, uh, sometimes, you know, people just sort of meandering along the street. And I would say to them, you know, look, if, you're, if, you, if your grandfather lived, if you were an old black man and you lived by the railroad tracks and it was 1975, where would you have to live, right? And I got a number of different answers, but eventually I found the railroad track stumbling and bumbling, but learning all along the way. And as you, as you, you, know, and as you mentioned, you know, the people who actually made the connection were people who I, I, I would have gone out of my way to avoid. Right. Um, and then I found uh, oil, oil and water. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it was my grandfather's house because the utility bill was still in my uh, my my when you, uh, you, great aunt's you name. You mentioned that when you I, I've lived through this. When you rent out a place, sometimes the, the the owner never the name never changes, and so you fifty years later. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, I mean, it, this it, is your grandfather's it, house. It was an interesting experience to have it confirmed, and of course, it was radically different than any memory that I that I'd had. What happened after that, though, was really extraordinary, and that was ultimately I, I found my cousins, uh, my dad's first cousins, my Aunt Sally's children, and their children, and they had a picture of my grandfather and his brother in the back of their house, and it was in this sort of a sanctuary in the, in the rear bedroom, and it was extraordinary because, I, you know, I feel like if I'd seen that picture anywhere in the United States, anywhere in the world, I would have said, hey, you know, that's, uh, that's kin to me, you know. 
And uh, my grandfather in the picture, he has his hair cut and sloped into a hairstyle that I used to wear when I was in uh, you know, <laughs> high school and nice college. nice photograph in the book, yeah. Yeah, something else. Um, and after that, I just had an experience of, of wanting to know and of wanting to make a, a, a powerful connection. And that's what took place over the, um, the next couple of years. And what I wound up doing, I would drive back to, uh, to Blair's and I would drive back to, uh, to Chatham, to the county courthouse, looking for records, um, trying to figure out who my grandfather's parents were, who their parents were ultimately. And it, the, the search kind of boiled down uh, or, or moved very quickly in two directions. I mean, one was, how do we get the surname Jackson? Uh, well, it turns out, you know, that Jackson is a very popular okay. Very popular surname, especially among African Americans. Um, I think it's something like 53% of the Americans named Jackson are, are African American. So I felt like, well, I was looking for a needle in a haystack, and, and here again, I might really come up, um, you know, sort of with 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 nothing to, uh, to to nothing solid to hold on to. And it was it was actually um, the most wrenching um, kind of experience as I got a couple of records, um, a marriage certificate here, um, a deed. Uh, there, um, a will written by a slave owner in the 1840s, and then finally um, finding a document um, that uh, that seems to capture the sale of my um, great grandfather's parents on June 14, 1860. Now, let me, I'm going to stop you right there, okay? Because you're writing this book, and it's everything is footnoted. The writing is dispassionate, eloquent, beautiful writing. But then when you say that in the book, like suddenly you realize that this man you discover was a slave, your great-grandfather, your mood slightly, the writing slightly changes to me as a reader, and I can feel your shock and incredulity. That's, that, that's what this book does to me. Yeah. It, does that make any sense as yeah. a reader? You know, the, I think the, the, the thing is we understand the past. Like it's like the page stops. We, we understand history. We understand it, you know, generically. Um, I mean, we, you, 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 you give me a fact and I say, okay, you know, I mean, I take that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, once you put a name to the person that was enslaved, um, and once you put a date to an experience that utterly transformed their lives, um, you, you have created an intimacy. And the, I think the, the language or the feeling that I have is, there's a different level of responsibility to a human being that you know than a statistic, a uh, person who survived the uh, Middle Passage, a person who made it through the first winter, um, somebody who uh, survived uh, rape or sexual assault repeatedly on a farm over a generation. Um, once you know something about the person, um, I mean, to get cut to the quick, yeah. the idea that um, uh, virtually everybody who was ever enslaved um, suffered some kind of family destruction. Uh, that they were sold. That they were sold at one point in their lives, and that they moved away from a family, um, biological family, uh, community family. Um, again, in the abstract, you say, "Okay, well, I can deal with that." But once I knew that Edward Jackson, more than likely, um, was a dower slave, um, sent away from the neighborhood that he'd grown up in and that his father was likely sold out of the state and that his mother was sold away and died before the end of the Civil mm -hmm. War, um, it, was, it was very different. It was very different. And, what, and, I, and Lawrence, I have to make this clear to the audience. What makes this book different from other books is that it's not just plugging in information to Ancestor.com. Mm -hmm. It's not just reading a, 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 a book of wills and probate records in, in, a, in a courthouse. Um, what, <clears throat> I think you addressed this in some interview, I forget, but uh, people take it for granted that we can just go back and find out who we are and what we came from, like Henry Louis Gates does that DNA thing. But you're talking about your own family and, and, and ordinary people. Um, I. I don't know if I'm making any sense, but we have a fixation on the on the on the bourgeoisie. Thank you. On the landowners. Thank you. Uh, the people that prosper. The celebrities. Uh, yeah, the yeah, ones yeah. who were able to. I was related you know, to Christopher Columbus. Right, yeah, yeah. Have a fantastic farm and send the kids to school, and you know, sure, slavery was uh, excruciating, but after that, you know, we're just walking uphill on yeah. crystal stairs, oh, and, and then of course, I mean, as Langston Hughes uh, wrote so eloquently, life. Was, is not no crystal, crystal stair. stair. Yeah. And that's, that's the, the pattern that I saw in my own family. I mean, you know, I just sort of wondered about um, 
sometimes I guess the tension between myself and my own father and what I could understand later in life between my dad and his dad. And you know, you see this all over um, um, black family life. But what happened to my family was that um, immediately after uh, slavery was over, I had one ancestor, uh, Granville Hunley, who was a, wow. uh, one of a handful of black men in this county um, who was able to purchase 40 acres. Didn't they have like $600? You know. Um, well, I mean, I people nowadays don't have $600. I think, <laughs> I, I, think it, you know, I think it was about $240 or something uh, yeah, yeah, you know, to, yeah. uh, to purchase this land. He was 62 years old yeah. when he bought the homestead. And I imagine that for somebody who had spent their life in bondage, who'd spent the first 60 years in bondage, that it must have seemed like, well, you know, this is the, this is the, the final accomplishment or achievement. Um, he enjoyed that prosperity for about 20 years before he died, and he passed the land on to his heirs, and it seems as if they lost it almost immediately. What happened in Danville and in Pennsylvania County um, was the, uh, the, the, the ebb and flow of American race relations. Um, I don't know that they necessarily reached their peak in 1865 right. when the federal troops chased uh, Jefferson Davis yeah. out from Danville, but um, it was the last headquarters. Uh, the, the last headquarters of the, of the Confederacy. Confederacy, exactly. The uh, the place where Jefferson Davis stayed, yeah, uh, yeah. the house of William T. Sutherland. This is the the major tobacco manufacturer, you know, sort of for the region. So it was always, you know, sort of tobacco and enslaved people of African descent. Um, so in the 1870s, you know, you have the readjuster party taking office. You have some African Americans that win elected office in Pennsylvania and in Danville especially. And this is sort of the, the, the high tide of uh, Granville Hundley's prosperity. But in 10 years, um, African Americans are driven from office. There's a major riot in Danville. And something like uh, pogroms begin to take place. I mean, not just in Virginia, but throughout the South. You made that point in a lecture. What in, in white history books they refer to like the Atlanta race riot. Yeah, the race that riot. That was just slaughtering blacks. Exactly. Right, 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 right. Exactly. Yeah. So I think that you know, I mean, this is something that we have to wrestle with. I mean, was slavery genocide? Um, was the slave trade genocide? Uh, uh, was the systematic destruction of families uh, genocidal? Um, and then what took place afterwards? I mean, you know, sort of was it genocidal? There's a wonderful, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can't again. leave this all to Quentin go Tarantino. Ahead, <laughs> no, there's a wonderful expression that you resuscitate from Ralph Ellison, the emotional schizophrenia of mm. American history. Mm. Talk about mm. that for a minute because in my feeling, it's, this book really moved me, Lawrence. Uh, you immersed me in what black people, what, dri what, what must drive people, black people insane. There's, the history makes no sense, yeah. and yet you, what do you tell your children? And that's what your book is about. Yeah, it's this question of your. I've got three questions this, in there. This question of your, you know, your your connection, your amor patria. Um, you know, what is your allegiance, and especially if it's consistently reconfigured. I mean, if it's always being challenged, and you always have to understand it on a new basis, and then new pieces of the historical record emerge or rewritten, um, a new narrative comes out that you have to take on. I, I have uh, thought very deeply about uh, Thomas Jefferson and uh, you know, sort of Monticello and of course what we know now about the relationships there. But one of the things that I find so fascinating is that you know, in some ways you can go from Ellison um, to Jefferson who was an extraordinary thinker and somebody who, who winds up waffling on this right. precise issue. And one of the things that I say in the book is that you know, you compare Jefferson to Phyllis Wheatley, and you have um, actually, in my opinion, he tried to crush Phyllis Wheatley's you, reputation. You have a stronger and I was, case. I never knew that. Yeah, you have a stronger case for you know, sort of uh, uh, the 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 thought about democratic equality right, right. with um, with Wheatley than with. Um, someone who, of course, is so well esteemed, and yeah, I mean, I, you, fin you find Jefferson almost systematically eliminating her contribution right, right. in s ways that he understood himself. I am confident as specious and falsified. But he felt threatened by Phyllis Sweet, right. yeah, right. because exactly. if she's good, but then what does that make him? And right, right. this is, of course, the um, the major tension that I feel like you can, if you if you have the antenna to notice it. You are aware of it uh, throughout the United States today, wherever you go. Um, I was astounded in some ways with the 
the thickness of the, uh, the racial tension in Chatham, where the county courthouse for Pennsylvania is located, the, the way it was today, I mean, right, right now, like if we went there this afternoon and we, you know, bought a, a soda at the, at the, uh, at the uh, gas station. And it's a, I think it's a, it's a challenge and it's also um, a, a significant part of what it means to be an American, something that has to be wrestled with and worked through. Um, a, um, a, one of Ellison's favorite uh, terms was he liked to talk about antagonistic cooperation. Um, that, that we can reach a plateau or a place where we can get work done that is mutually fulfilling and at the same time um, we have a healthy antagonism that perhaps must be preserved if we are to maintain our integrity. For me there was a moment like this at the end of my journey when I finally found you know sort of a tangible landmark or you know like where was Granville Hundley's 40 acres, where was the old homestead, where must the cabins and barns have been that my ancestors lived in, the places where they worked, the, the ground that they loved. And I found um, this slave owner's um, house which had been lovingly preserved. And it's this thing about um, which elements of the past we lovingly preserve, which ones we archive. You must, you must forgive me, that's not the house that was restored from its original This like, is the 1852, one that was restored. And this that's wonderful exactly couple right. invited you in. And so I'm invited. And there little busts of li little Negro children. I'm oh, come on, come I'm on. invited into the house. Um, there's a bust of Robert E. Lee in, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. in the foyer. And the little uh, figurines there, there are, so. are There are uh, what we would call you know, derogatory caricatures. Sure, sure of the ceramic uh, derogatory caricatures of African nice Americans. Yeah. And these people are asking me if I would like to break bread with them, if I would like to, you know, what we would say is share a libation with them. So, it, you know, I mean, here was a case where I was beholden to them for their generosity because they were giving me a piece of the history, a piece of the story that I really could get no other way. But at the same time, I wanted to preserve my own sense of connection to my ancestors, so I declined the libation. Um, you know, another one of these moments, and, and arguably the most poignant one in the book, takes place when I was at the library at the University of Virginia. And I have a memory of my, my family being on that campus, and my sister went to University of Virginia as a freshman. And the four of us, you know, we were walking the campus, and, you know, I just remember my dad was very prickly that day. This is about, it's about 1981, fall of 1981. And I could never understand his prickliness at uh, particular situations. I remember this thing, we'd go to the restaurant and we'd get seated by the kitchen door and, uh, you know, you would get the full sense of the man at that time and, you know, the maitre d' quickly, you know, recti rectified the problem. But, it, you know, I just sort of remember, you know, thinking, man, you know, why, why doesn't he relax more? And um, I, so I'm in the library uh, 30 years later, really, and... Um, I'm looking through these ledgers, these documents, and there's one box that's, you know, it just says Pennsylvania County ledgers, um, no index, no description of what I'll find. It's at the end of the day, and I start pouring through these, this variety of ledgers, and the very last one that I pulled out of the box um, was a, uh, an account book written by a man named Vincent Dickerson. Wow, I and remember that. It was absolutely extraordinary. This was the person who inherited the estate of Griffith Dickerson, and he had been obliged by his father's will to keep intact the uh, families of the enslaved. And on June 14, 1860, however, he sold Sandy and Jenny Dickerson. The great paradox. We'll, that's for, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. And, but it, it was this extraordinary moment. So these, were, yeah, these yeah. were Edward's parents, the people that he says were his parents on his marriage certificate. And I've been trying to sort of figure out, you know, I mean, is this a real connection or is it an imaginary connection? Was it a social connection or is it a biological um, tie? But to understand that sort of wrenching moment that this precisely at this time, you know, sort of uh, the Civil War is about nine months away and emancipation is, uh, you know, four, uh, four and a half years, five years away. But to understand that right at this, at this, at this, this pivot, you know, in sort of history for our family, um, something wrenching and extraordinary happened, um, causing him to move away, to lose contact, possibly never to see his mother again, and then to change, it seems as if Edward changes his name to Jackson in a moment of uh, affirming a new identity and trying to escape this difficult past. And I'm looking at this document and 
I, I, you know, I mean, I just couldn't believe it. I mean, I want to spit on this document, right? I mean, this is something that's in the slaveholder script. This is something that, uh, you know, showed their financial acumen. Um, this is something that uh, is evidence of the, um, the bounty that's passed on to the white Dickersons and their heirs. And it's a document, um, a, a sort of a legislation of destruction to me. Um, this is an example of the erasure of a complex um, national identity um, to me. And I, I cannot figure out whether or not, you know, this is something that we need to preserve and learn from or if it's something that we need to burn in a pile. I've, Lawrence, I could talk to you forever about this, but I, I want to conclude with just one notion. In the, in the beginning of the book, you talk about your father's passing when you were in college. Uh, very briefly, you said you had a contentious relationship with your father. Uh, you couldn't you, you admired his serenity. What would he think of this book, very oh, briefly? Wow. I mean, that's a, what, what a question. I, I say, you know, that my father went back to Guinea. Because he's, he's in the book throughout yeah. the entire, every yeah. page I turned, he's in the book. Yeah. I mean, he, he, was, he was an extraordinary man. And I, I didn't understand that when we lived together in the same house. And I didn't know that until I had my own Nathaniel. Wow. And sort of seeing wow. this guy and, you know, I'm saying, Nathaniel, you know, it's time to take up the dishes or to, you know, make yeah. your bed or something. And I, I get so much more about that connection and the sacrifices that fathers make to be with sons. Wow. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, here's to Lawrence P. Jackson, full professor at Emory University. Here's to his wonderful family. Here's to your father, your parents, your great-grandfather, your grandfather, to everybody in your family. This book was one of the most moving books I've read ever. Uh, I hope to have you on the show again. Congratulations. James, thank you very Congratulations. much. Congratulations. Thank you. That's it. This Comments and opinions expressed on Writers in Focus are those of the individual participants and are presented for the purpose of discussion only. No endorsements by Atlanta Fulton Public Library System or Fulton County Government are intended and none should be presumed.